Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Catherine Elkali. I'm the co-chair of Global Win, the women's interactive network here at the bank. Welcome to Women's History Month. We're excited to kick off the month with a CEO series event. We're very fortunate to have a special guest here tonight, who my co-chair will introduce to you in just a moment. First, I'd like to like to introduce you to Sam Saperstein, co-chair of WIN and the chief marketing officer for the Commercial Bank, who will moderate our event this evening. I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you all so very much for coming out to celebrate uh, Women's History Month. We're so very happy to see you. I think we've seen a really great demand for WIN, the Women's Interactive Network, for our programming, for networking events like this. So we really thank you and appreciate all your support. In just one year since 2013, we've seen a 60% increase in our membership of WIN. So I think that just shows you there's a real demand for us to come together, talk to each other, and have these kinds of events. So thank you all very much. Uh, this year's theme for Women's History Month is Women's Women of character, courage, and commitment. And I think that theme really resonates with us for several reasons. Um, first, in the, on the topic of courage, we've heard a lot about courage over the last year. Last year, when Sheryl Sandberg came in to speak with us about Lean In, she talked about the importance of having courage as you take your rightful seat at the table, you know, the business table with your colleagues. And she talked about having the courage to stand up with your convictions and to really express your point of view. So it's something that I think just you know, continues to resonate with us today as a very important theme. On the topic of commitments, we've also seen great commitment just on the part of our own senior executive women here at the firm. I'm sure many of you have seen the Women on the Move effort that's been kicked off over the last few months, where we've seen members of the operating committee, we've seen our CEOs of the businesses and other senior leaders really go on a global road show and talk to women all over the world about what it's like to be a woman employee at JP Morgan, what they could do better, what we can all do better. So keep your feedback coming. I think that commitment really is a two-way street. You know, from them to us and for us to really show our support for them. So it's great themes across the board. Um, tonight, of course, is our signature event where we showcase a guest who really exemplifies the themes that we wanted to talk about today. And I think Julie here really uh, just brings all these traits to life. So let me introduce her to you. Julie Macklow is an entrepreneur who is uh, here to talk about her business career and also talk about her new venture. She started a skincare industry, a skincare company, which I think we're all going to really enjoy learning a lot about. Um, she's very passionate about the brand. She's a true believer in the mission. So I think we're going to learn a lot from her tonight. Before starting her business, she worked in finance as a hedge fund manager and a private equity investor. Plus, she's an alumna of our very own firm here, working at JP Morgan Partners in the early stage of her career. So we'll talk about that as well. So it's welcome to you back to the firm. Uh, Julie launched her company, V Beauté, in 2011. Um, now she sits at the intersection of beauty and business, and she probably is one of the few people you'll see both in Vogue and on Bloomberg Business News. So it's a very interesting um, overlapping of uh, lives. And she manages her business while maintaining her home, her family, and a very active life in fashion, art, and philanthropy. So it's going to be a good discussion, and we welcome you very much, Julie. Well, Thank you for having me. I'm very, very excited to be here. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Um, so let's just set the stage here for your early career. So you were in finance. Um, you have a finance degree, an economics degree. Started here um, at Chase in your early part of the career. To lay, lay out for us what that early career was yeah, like. Yeah. So um, actually, I was I started at Chase Capital Partners out of University of Virginia. Um, Jeff Walker, who ran Chase Capital, hired me out of college. In those days, they were it was pretty rare that that would happen. So I had done a summer in mergers and acquisitions at Goldman Sachs after not sleeping for about, I think, the entire summer. And right. too many, this was before emails really occurred, and you, you had to actually job, go with the book to the Hamptons. <laughs> That was enough for me. So um, I was very happy. I remember Goldman's like, you're doing what? And I'm like, no, but this private equity thing seems really good. So um, started there. It was, you know, I spent about two years in New York. Um, those were back in sort of the 1999, 2000, the first internet bubble. Mm. Um, learned a lot about VC. And then I was fortunate enough to sort of beg to go to Asia. So I went off to Hong Kong without knowing a person there. Oh, wow. And um, I think that was sort of a really character, career-defining moment, because um, they stationed me in Korea, actually in Seoul, on the leverage buyout of Kumo Tire. I actually say, if working in Korea doesn't kill you, nothing will. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a very challenge. You know, I don't think they were used to actually seeing women work in Korea. 
they sort of mistaked me often for a call girl. They weren't quite sure what to make of me. So, you know, I was very good at pouring sake, though, which uh, is sort of where I learned to drink scotch. So, um, <laughs> needless to say, my biggest job was to attend the meetings sort of from 7 a.m., then pour scotch till the men passed out around like probably 2 a.m., crunch the model, make sure I was back at the meeting when they started. So, so you, you didn't know, get any more sleep. It you know, sleep is overrated in Asia for sure. So, um, <laughs> you know, and then I moved back and I was fortunate enough to have met a woman, Karen Feinerman, she's on CNBC Fast Money, and I took a job with her as a analyst. It was a retail value driven fund. So in a weird way, sort of similar to the private equity background I'd had, and they'd shared offices with another fund, Scoggin, so I actually got work for both the firms. Um, I spent about two years sort of doing general, all sorts of things. I guess my view is always like, do as many things as possible so you could learn as many things. And I really found like I loved fashion, I loved retail, and about the same time when I came back, I was introduced to my husband on a blind date actually from somebody who worked at the firm. So um, I found sort of with him, I was more in benefits. I was like, oh, I like this fashion stuff. Mm -hmm. So I started to focus on stocks and companies really more in the fashion on space. The side on, on the business side. On the business industry. side. So I started following companies like Foot Locker and you know, Claire's and um, companies that I think you could find a mall. And I spent a lot of time actually walking malls as a result. That's but great. That seems <laughs> that like is, a dream come true. Yeah, it, you know, it seems much more glamorous than it was. But um, that was, I'd say, in a nutshell, sort of the early part of my career. And then after about three and a half, almost four years there, I just I spent a lot of time sort of working for them and run. I was to a point where I ran a small portfolio, and so I went to I'm almost embarrassed to say the name at this point, Steve Cohen, and I got my, myself a little portfolio with him um, of fifty million dollars under the Sigma branch, and um, I spent about four years there working running a retail consumer fund. Oh, great. Yeah, and then I, um, you know, 08 happened, which was, you know, a lovely time to be trading stocks. Mm -hmm. um, about the same time I actually was in 08, I think in February, I was a Vogue It girl. And I remember Steve Cohen being, hey, IT girl, go fix my computer. Because <laughs> they're like, what the hell is a Vogue It girl? Like, no one knew what that was. So I was sort of the butt, butt of everyone's jokes for a while there. And um, you're much better dressed, I'm sure than the IT folks. Well, the, the competition was fairly low, I'm just going to say. <laughs> so, um, and then I went from SAC to Israel Englander has a fund where he seeds people, so I started Maclo Asset Management. Great. And I was running about $250 million on each side. And then um, I met these girls, Bobble Bar, when I was sort of just on the side two girls out of HBS, and I was really fascinated how they had the courage and started their own company, and I was sort of bored in finance. I'd you know, been doing it for 12 years, and I was like, oh, this seems like a really good idea. And, but I hadn't really thought about what that idea was, and sure enough, that's when I sort of went on my trip and came up with the idea of the It Kid and so, Debutech. Yes, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, so when you went to Asia, you said you didn't know anybody there, but it sounds like you wanted that experience, you're willing to have that international yeah. experience, something new. What was it like being a woman really there, you know, the day to day? I mean, you mentioned the things that people were expecting you to be and do. How was, was that I mean, challenging for you? I was really fond of drinking espresso. I mean, you have to understand, in Asia, I think my assistant would work till 9 or 10 p.m. Oh. So as an analyst, you're taking everyone's work. Um, it, what was great was sort of the modeling experience I had done earlier on just became that much better mm -hmm. because it was, you know, one leverage buyout model after the next. I was on an abattoir deal in Singapore, which you can imagine really smelled. And <laughs> there, it was just, you know, I have to say, making friends in Asia isn't a hard thing to do, especially in Hong Kong because there are so many expats. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more challenging thing is the, the amount of work and the expectation, it's a 24-hour job when you're there. Mm -hmm. And you know they like to work hard and play hard in Asia. Right, so right. it doesn't necessarily stop when you leave the office. Then the whole team goes out. And almost every waking hour is with sort of the people you mm -hmm. work with there. Um, but I think it was really, I had really asked to go there 
Because I felt like everyone, you send meetings in New York and they'd be like, global firm, global firm. I'm like, these guys have no idea what a global firm is. I bet half of them have even gone out of the country. So like, I, I was like, I want to go see what it's like in different cultures. And sure enough, Korea was a culture shock. I mean, I spent almost a year on the leverage by Kumo Tire. And I, I'll never forget, I was sitting in a conference room at the Hotel Latte, and there was our whole team, so it was about 20 men, Korean from mostly, and then our team was from Hong Kong. And they, they looked at me like, why is she here? And, but the, it was so interesting. The guy who was the very famous um, bartender of the Hotel Latte, they had actually never even seen I think, a girl who is blonde. So he serenaded me in the middle of the private room in Korean. With your colleagues around you. And everyone around me. Uh, and the president of Kumo Tire had to actually translate from <laughs> Korean to English what he was saying. And then needless to say, I ended up eating the sorbet or something. I had the worst food poisoning in my life. And I literally was in bed in Korea for about three weeks. I finally had um, my doctor in New York, FedEx Cipro, which saved me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, I, of course, don't travel without Cipro. <laughs> and your products, too. And my products. Um, it kid and Cipro, okay? You throw so was that training just very helpful for you as you went on to your careers in finance, but then also your yes. business? Yes. I mean, to be doing that sort of financial modeling on a daily basis and the interactions and going on the deals and doing the pitch books, I mean, you don't understand how many times I would do the exact same pitch book over and over again with small changes. Then you had to go to like the print room and wait for it. And right. wait, you know, it was back in the days where you were waiting till you know 4 a.m. as you had to. So, yeah. um, but I think the discipline and the financial skills it gives you are skills you just can't learn anywhere. I always tell people, I said, if you can get a job in banking. It might not be the most fun job, but it'll really give you a skill set that I think very few women have later on. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, so then while you were transitioning to, to these different funds, you had your daughter in mm -hmm. 2007. How did you manage all these things you know, around the same period? I mean, that's... I really, I really wish I had sent you this great photo. I mean, I was actually on a laptop with my wireless card. Zoe's born October 19th, 2007, which was the first Black Friday. The market was down like 600 points. I traded through the whole thing, and I was IMing, and Steve's like, Aren't you in labor? I'm like, I'm like, yeah. I'm like hooked up to the machine. The I got the oxygen everywhere. mask. I had vitamin water. They're like, you can't drink that. I was like, don't you tell me what I can drink. I can drink it. And I wouldn't actually let them induce me. So I refused to even like push till 4 p.m. when it shut. Marcus. So needless to say, Zoe was born at like 4:55 p.m. And um, you know, then I sort of and I actually made sure I drank castor oil so I could go into labor on a Friday because they wouldn't induce you on a Friday. I was like, who's going to watch my portfolio? <laughs> so I had the weekend to recover, and then I was sort of sitting on my pillow you know, by Monday, and then between the sits baths, and I'd go and trade, and then I was back on the treadmill and work by Friday. Oh I mean, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Okay. There was sort typical. of no one else not to show up. <laughs> I'm not trying to encourage it, but you know. <laughs> but you knew the priorities. Um, so let's talk about your business now. <laughs> Well, you know, who was else? Who was running my portfolio? <laughs> True. Um, tell me about being an entrepreneur. What made you want to start your own business, especially yeah. in skincare? Yeah. So, uh, skincare kind of came from the idea. So, when I was, uh, as I said, I was running my hedge fund, and I had met these two girls, and about the same time, I went to my girlfriend's wedding, and I actually am the person, they always steal my luggage. I don't know why, or they, it gets lost. And last time we were in Russia, so when we were going to Paris, I crammed all my gowns for like five day wedding into a travel and suitcase. Sure enough, my husband, I think, crammed some stuff in there too, and they took my toiletries. It's happened to probably like everyone here. Um, and no big deal, you're in Paris, go buy new stuff. So I felt really upsold. I spent a lot of money buying expensive stuff. And then her actual wedding was in Deauville, Normandy, which I think has 100 people who live there. And I was breaking out head to toe in hives from the stuff I had just spent so much money on. I was like, this is, you know, I was cursing a lot. And I was just like, this is not going to happen to me. So I sketched on sort of a piece of paper the idea of the kit itself. 
Um, obviously, having a cool kit doesn't really create a company. So I sort of threw it, the idea with my husband, like, I think I'm going to do this. And that's why I decided to sort of shut down what I was doing. And um, through people I knew, I got in touch with the best lab in the world, CRB Labs. Um, they're in Switzerland. They do lines like La, La Prairie, Chantecaille, Revive. So they're really very well renowned. I started working with them on the formulations. Mm. Um, and we actually launched with the five kits and the it kit, as well as a six SKU light up. And all the packaging, the package design. And I have to say, that took almost two and a half years. So that was a full-time job because yeah. you're trademarking everything. You have to come up with, you know, what is this formula for? And so when, that was actually a really interesting experience. Like, why do I need this line? What didn't I like? Mm -hmm. So um, they've been working with this new active, the Swiss Alpine Rose. Yeah. Um, and what I thought was really cool, I was, I'm from Aspen. I like skiing. And this plant lives in the Swiss Alps for 100 years, actually dies in summer, rejuvenate, I'm sorry, dies in winter, rejuvenates itself in summer. And it, you know, it has great properties towards rejuvenation. So they found that by taking stem cells of the Swiss Alpine rose plant, they could apply it towards skin. Oh, that's great. Now, obviously, I'm 97, so I need the best in anti-age technology. <laughs> so, exactly. So we partnered it with a patented biocellular peptide, um, reduces fine lines and wrinkles in 30 days, boosts collagen, rich in antioxidants. And what was really unique about that is we combined the formulations to make our complex. Then, because I'm so sensitive, we made the line vegan, fragrance-free, gluten-free, nut-free, oat-free. So stripped it out, all these Exactly, additives. with the idea that there's a lot of common allergens that are in products, and people don't even realize it. I yeah, mean, no. they, they don't think about Until that. Until it's too late. Until you're out. breaking out, and you can't really return open products, right. right? So tell us about this IT kit. I love the names of the products, the IT kit, yeah. the day job cream. So Yeah, so I'll just run through it. So the IT kit has your five travel essentials. So the IT kit comes from V Bute, meaning V. Obviously, V is a women's empowerment symbol. The five products in the IT kit, and V is your... Um, v is your victory over time. So you'll notice there's sort of double meanings in everything. Mm -hmm. Undercover agents are anti-age serum. It's like a drink of water for your skin. It's really lightweight. Um, then we have buying time everyday cream, which you would use on top of that. So serum cream, eye creams, the routine. Buying time everyday cream has ceramides two and three for 24 hour moisturization. As a plant from South America, which helps open up the pores to hydrate. And again, as our Alpine Rose um, and our anti-age technology. And I never, my husband swears by this, I never actually reduces fine lines and wrinkles, but dark circles and deep puffs. And it's great as like um, basically a primer under makeup. You need to get that to your former colleagues. Yeah, exactly. If you if you're up late at night, you really need it. I never. My husband says it gets got rid of all those dark circles. Perfect. And he lives with me, so you Perfect. can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and then as a cleanser, as an exfoliator, which you know you need on the go. And then we had our um, six skew, which is light up, which is for spot treatment for dark circles um, against sun damage. And then we created day job, which was almost took us three years. It's twenty percent micronized zinc. And people don't realize, like, the thing that really makes you old is being in the sun. And you're talking to somebody who used to lay out with baby oil, <laughs> I think, when I was 18. So uh, that, you do not want to do that. Um, so day job is 20% micronized zinc. What's great is it blends flawlessly, so it doesn't give you that chalky whiteness that zinc does. Um, it has no chemicals. So even the zinc sunscreens, if you look at the labels, they have like four or five other chemicals. Right. And then we launched Lip Spread. So our purple lip gloss. It's like a mood ring for your lip. Everyone gets a unique color shade. It's our top seller. It's really cool. It's very natural color, sort of day to night. And then those were so popular, we created a whole series of lip spreads. And they're all really, what's great about our lip spreads is they're really silky and hydrating, and they are long lasting. So I ski, and you know my, my lip spread's still on. And I made them purposely in these small little things so they could fit easily into your small pocketbook or your you know, pocket. Really on the go. Really, yeah, on so the I'm go. I'm assuming this stuff makes it through the airport security. Yes. No problem. So you now. shut it, no Ziplocs, great question. Yep. Everything, we minimize the package. So you just put it in, scans right through. Great. Exactly. And they're not stealing any of your stuff anymore. Um, nine more. <laughs> <laughs> So when you were putting the products out, what were the, what was the target audience that you were going after? You know, yeah. the woman, and how were you trying to reach her? 
So we started actually at Bergdorf Goodman, mm -hmm. which was our bread and butter. Uh, Deborah Davidson, who's there, my COO, was with Estee Lauder for 25 years and had a great relationship. And actually, when I um, did the prototype of lab samples, brought the five pound prototype of the IT kit and worked with them. And Bergdorf helped us with things so like they were a positioning. Partner to you. They partnered with us, the great. pricing. And we were in their new lab concept with a bunch of other small brands like Tata Harper. Mm -hmm. And it was a really interesting and great experience because you know I'd be wiping the counters and selling on the floor. And because Bergdorf's is just one store, mm -hmm. it's very manageable. I'd spend almost every weekend at Bergdorf. Zoe would be like, where are you going, mommy? Are we selling IT kits? today <laughs> obviously we'd go lunch and you know I'd usher her around the floor so you know she a good get, saleswoman Sales you know kid. she claims she is I, you know, <laughs> that's debatable but you know I don't want to get in trouble for child labor so <laughs> um, <laughs> she was three or four <laughs> yeah she's five <laughs> old enough so um, <laughs> So yeah, and you know, it was like I had not come from beauty and there was a lot I needed to learn about what motivates somebody to buy products, why people buy one brand over another, marketing, collateral. It's a very personal yeah. product. You're putting it on your skin, you're wearing it every day. I mean, yes, and skin care, which I didn't know at the time, is probably the hardest sell in beauty. Mm -hmm. Because once people switch, they switch probably for a very long time, but, and it's very sticky, but yeah. the initial sell people are very hesitant. So, so things loyal. like sampling is very important, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, took, um, it took a fair bit of time to get the brand sort of the awareness, the marking. You know, Bergdorf always thought my ads were too racy and in your face. So there are a lot of fights about those ads. Uh. And, uh, but you know, over time, then we launched with Whites and the Hamptons. I feel like that's where we really started to build awareness. We started to do some fairly provocative ads, and they got a lot of attention. And then um, I came up sort of after doing that for about a year and a half, we came up with this crazy idea. We'd been approached by Walgreens. Actually, it was somebody who worked for us. It was 